So, welcome everyone to this little introduction to the OWASP 2 shop project. Uh, my name is Björn. I'm the inventor, project lead, and main developer of the of this little lovely application, which I started in 2014. But I still consider it the most modern uh, vulnerable web application for training and uh, exercise purposes. So, here to give you a little bit of an overview of what the application can do. So, for beginners, it should be totally totally fine. And uh, if you knew the Juice Shop like three years ago. There's lots of new stuff we actually have. So, let's begin. You will find these in the form of postcards uh, scattered in the keynote room. So this is basically our, our tagline. Um, so we consider ourselves the most, probably the most modern and sophisticated insecure web application. And it can be used for all kinds of purposes. And I will show almost uh, everything, at least in a in form of slides, but I also have some live demos, and I'm pretty sure I will have lots of fun with my mouse here on this on this slopey uh, surface. So let's begin. Immediately diving into a little exercise of a Happy Path shopping tour. So let's go to the juice shop. I started it locally already. This is how it looks when you start it up. Um, so you can read the welcome message, or you can just get rid of it, um, which is totally fine. We have everything you need from a legal perspective, so the sophisticated cookie banner down here. Of course I want cookies. And yeah, so this is this is the application from a regular user's perspective. So you can browse through lots of cool cool stuff that we actually sell, lots of merchandise, some things you will actually find here or in the other rooms. And yeah. But you cannot put anything into your, your shopping basket. So maybe that's because I'm not logged in at the moment. Let's take a look here at the menu. Okay, so you can leave, obviously, uh, customer feedback, even anonymously. So we will not try that right now. There's an About Us page with the corporate history and policy. Very interesting. There's all the social media links you need. Okay, great. There's a publicly accessible photo wall. Okay, so this looks like some happy juice shop customers have published their experience in some way. And there's a broken image here. Well, never mind. And the help getting started link is what we might actually need in, in a bit uh, a bit later. So let's actually do some shopping. So I will not register because it just takes a while with address and credit card and all that stuff, right? So of course we are PCI DSS compliant. So then I, I will just use the demo account, which is well prepared for a little bit of shopping. So let's see, what do I want to have? Actually, I really like the banana juice and maybe see ah, a new mark might be nice 2199 okay that's crazy <coughs> expensive but okay what can you do i need a new mark and maybe also a hoodie if it's getting colder all right so some stuff in my basket now <clears throat> and it seems the application is really great with rounding so that's a good sign if you're good with with uh, numbers when you're doing uh, business actually so uh, let's check out I will even get some bonus points for this order. Cool. So I've select my predefined address here. I can choose between different delivery speeds. So maybe I uh, can see better if I zoom in a bit. I don't know if the camera will like that, but feel feel free to. So let's uh, pick. Wow. Well, okay. I'm, it's not that important, but I will pay an additional fifty, whatever currency this is, for fast delivery. I can choose paying either by my already registered credit card. I can add a new one, or I can use my in-store wallet. Okay. And there's also other payment options, but that's just me trying to sell merchandise to you guys. Okay, good. So then let's close that real quick. Or collect donations for OWASP, of course. 
So let's pay with the with the wallet. Place your order. Thank you for your purchase. Okay, great. I can now look at my order confirmation here. Lovely PDF without rounding errors this time. That's cool. And I can also already go to the tracking page and see. Okay, it's still in the warehouse, obviously, but in three days it should be should be at my home. Cool. So now, since I'm logged in, there's lots of more stuff I can do. I could, for example, complain if my order was somehow wrong or something I was unhappy with. I could talk with the chatbot. So, um, my name is Björn. So, hi, okay. And I could ask it questions. Okay, that didn't work. So, maybe how much is apple juice? Okay, it will tell me how much apple juice and lemon juice is. So, all kinds of crazy features. There's even more stuff you can do with the application from a just normal user perspective. So, we're not hacking anything yet, right? So, it's just the regular use cases you find in e-commerce application. A little bit simplified, but you can visit your order history. You can request containers for recycling, um, I don't know, used uh, bottles or whatnot. You can edit your address. You can check your wallet. There's privacy settings. You can even, and I'm serious about this, enable two-factor authentication with the with uh, with the juice shop. So, lots of stuff you can actually do. So that's the the good part, right? So it's a fully functional web shop where you can buy juice, but it has a few problems. So, actually, there's 101 hacking challenges hidden in the juice shop that you can and try to exploit, right? And try to solve to uh, show how good of a hacker you are. And they are categorized, as you can see here, we have everything that you would expect uh, from the OWASP Top 10 or other sources. So, I would say the, the OWASP Top 10, 20... 13 upwards is all fully fully included, right? So the challenges, these 101 challenges, are separated into different difficulties. So we have six difficulty levels, ranging from rather easy up to really crazy complicated. And the complicated ones really t sometimes take like multiple steps to actually then finally finally get it solved, right? And uh, some are really, really tough. So that's why we we are fair and try to tell people up front, okay, how difficult is this probably going to be? And when you start hacking, you can actually follow your progress and see your success on the uh, built-in scoreboard, which you can see a screenshot of here. But we will now take a look at the actual scoreboard. And the thing is that Juice Shop doesn't tell you where the scoreboard is up front. Because it's one of the typically first challenges to solve to actually find the scoreboard. And that's what we're going to do. If you remember this welcome pop-up at the beginning, this had it had one red button saying help getting started. And a similar link is also available here. So if you are not in a training where the trainer tells you, okay, there's a scoreboard, now go find it, you can still uh, follow this link here and then it will start explaining to you how to find this, this scoreboard. So our little helpful bot here will give you some hints and it will explain what you can, uh, what you should do to actually find the scoreboard which is hidden here in the application. You can skip tips that you don't really need. So, and it now recommends to either go just URL guessing or take a look at the client side JavaScript code in the dev tools, basically, right? So, and it will now say, okay, if you want, then open the dev tools with F12. And then when I do what it should actually do, it should now progress because it should actually notice that the dev tools are opened, but this is buggy for quite some time thanks to some Chrome changes. So it will be stuck on this tip here for a while. But I can skip the tip to just go to the next one. So what I could do now, I could either just guess URLs 
or I can actually take a look at the JavaScript sources like recommended here. So, uh, hope you can see that. So we have different JavaScript files here in the application. Uh, one that sounds quite promising is of course the main JS. Let's open that up. And if I scroll down, you can see that this is the main uh, application and it only has like, where are we going here? Ah, uh, just a couple, couple of lines. So um, I think you can, uh, if you don't print it, yeah, it has like uh, 200,000 characters or something. Good. So let's pretty print it and let's try to look for something that sounds like scoreboard. I will just search for score and take a look if I, if this reveals the actual location. So this is some properties, obviously. Let's continue searching. What do we have here? Uh, that doesn't help so much. Okay. What about this? It's just the title. Scoreboard challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an application being defined, title. Ah, here's a path. It seems here's a complete list of paths. So it seems the application defines a path called scoreboard. So let's try to actually use that. And it will now give me some confetti and the tutorial script. This little uh, bot is now gone because I completed the challenge and I'm now officially on the scoreboard. You see this lovely notification here, which you can, of course, close. And now let's zoom out again. And this is the entire list of juice shop challenges, initially filtered a little bit so it doesn't, it doesn't completely overwhelm newcomers. So it's only showing the one star challenges by default, right? But if you want, you can just uh, show everything and then you have a lot of stuff to do. Let's put it like that. So, and what you can now do, you can now start uh, picking your favorite um, hacking challenges, so to say, and start playing around. For example, let's only show for starters cross-site scripting. So, and only the, the easiest ones. There's just two challenges. One is called DOM XSS. Okay, and it tells me, okay, I have to perform a DOM XSS attack with this particular payload because the juice shop needs to verify if you successfully exploited the vulnerability and it will do so by comparing payloads in, in the case of uh, cross-site scripting at least. So if I have now no idea what I should do, I could hover here over this little button on the side and it will give me a little, a little hint, like look for an input field where its content appears in the HTML when the form is submitted. Okay, that sounds like your classical search field, right? So let's let's see what happens when I search for something. Search for OWASP, it will show me all the OWASP related projects, but it will also do this classical thing, right? So let's see if we can play around with that a bit. So let's, for example, try to do this. And hmm, surprise, there's a line that shouldn't be there, right? So I was able to inject this HR tag into this page. So now it's not that much further to the actual challenge where it tells me, okay, please use this, which would create a pop-up via an iframe. Let's see if that works. Put that in here. I get the pop-up, I click OK, you get confetti again, and we get this notification and we actually solved one of the one of the many, many hacking challenges. Okay, so back to the presentation for now. You can also uh this the, the, the juice shop that I started is running in the normal regular mode, right? So it's every challenge is un unlocked by default. You can also run it in tutorial mode where it will only um, allow you to do the one-star challenges first, which have a tutorial similar to this one with the little bot 
that helped us find the scoreboard, right? And there's like, I think, four one-star challenges with similar scripts. And once you solved all these, then you will get the two-star challenges with tutorials unlocked. And then the three-star, and then that's it. I think there's like 10 total challenges which have tutorials. And after you unlocked all of them, it will then basically uh, give you access to the entire scoreboard. So this is quite useful if you have, especially in a classroom or lecture setup, uh, let's say, less experienced participants, and you don't want them to just stumble around and not not really know what they should do, or already start working on stuff they're not supposed to, right? So you can use that a little bit uh, to structure your, your training, for example. What the Juice Shop also does, and that is a relatively new feature, so it tries behind the scenes to do find out if you're cheating. And it's doing that uh, not particularly sophisticated. It's basically just counting the time between two challenges being solved. So if I would go now here to my console, which is showing my currently running local instance output, you can see that it started listening here on this port for some time. And then I solved the one star scoreboard challenge in 41 minutes and it, it, it's, it's expected to take roughly one minute because it's one of the easiest challenges and there is a tutorial, right? So this is of course a, a, a cheat score of zero. Then this local XSS challenge, I took three minutes and it's also expected to take maybe one or less than one would be considered cheating. So also it's a, it's a, it's a score of zero, right? So I'm, I'm obviously not that good with hacking because I take very long time, so I don't even trigger my own cheat detection. But um, in the screenshot here, you can see uh, that if you are too fast, then you get actually uh, cheat points. So between zero and one, like a spam, like a spam index, basically. And uh, that is summed up. So it's point, uh, printed out per challenge, but also you have some some total cheat score. That, for example, a trainer who's hosting like, I don't know, 20 instances for his students can then uh, just access and see, okay, is there anyone here that is really a little bit too fast, right? Uh, so maybe they're just looking up something in a video or following some some step-by-step -step instructions. Of course, it's not bulletproof, but it's a start. Another thing that is completely new is uh, coding challenges. So Jewshop was, for the first years, all about just hacking. But we uh, recently added, for some of the hacking challenges, uh, um, a corresponding coding challenge, where you are supposed to find out where the actual vulnerability is in the code, and then select a possible fix. And I will quickly show how that actually works. And that's the main reason why I actually solved the DOM XSS challenge. Not because it's so exciting, but because it has a coding challenge associated with it. So now that I solved this, I could launch this additional challenge. As you can see, for this bonus payload challenge, I cannot launch it yet because it expects you to first do the hacking and then the coding part. You can even configure that to make the coding challenges always available if you want. But this is the, let's say, most natural flow, I would guess. So let's launch the coding challenge. And this little loading time that you just noticed, right, to actually load the code snippet and then just getting back 19 lines, this is not because the Jewshop is so inefficient. Uh, it's because this code snippet is actually pulled from the real source code files of the Jewshop. So every location, every every source uh, in a uh, piece of code in the Drew shop that has a vulnerability where we could also add some coding challenge for has some markers in the code, which basically say, okay, this is where the snippet starts, this is where it ends, and then it also says this line is the the vulnerable one, right? And then it will dynamically load this from the code and then show it to the user. Well, and I'm now supposed to find out where the actual problem is. So let's see. I'm pretty sure that two lowercase is something that you shouldn't do. That's, that just sounds terrible. So 
fourth uh, row five it must be. I'm I'm very sure about this, but it seems that I'm wrong. Okay, then maybe it's this. Uh, maybe it's this empty state. Okay, that was also wrong. Surprise, surprise. But as it was the second wrong answer, the juice shop will now give me a little additional hint what might be the right answer. So and if I'm continuing to submit wrong answers, it will give me more hints and they get a little bit more detailed every time. Typically, we have like two or three hints per coding challenge. And after that, it will just bluntly tell me the line that is correct. Right? So I guess you all know the line already, but just for fun, let's try out this. Right? So this is the last hint, I think. And now it will just tell me, hey, this is line six is actually the problem. Right? Obviously, because it doesn't get any more uh, obvious than calling a function called bypass security, I guess, right? So let's see. Because fun fact, if you're not familiar with Angular, which is the front end framework being used here, it is pretty resistant against uh, cross-site scripting by default, right? Because it does proper output encoding just out of the box. And you have to actually tell it to turn that off if you want cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which you, you guys should never want in your applications. It's only something that I should want in the juice shop, right? So let's submit this instead. Again, confetti, of course. And now we're in phase two of the coding challenge, which is the fix it part. And here I'm shown different options how to, how to fix this uh, vulnerability. And I can select one and I'm supposed to, you can see it here, submit this, the one that I think is correct. I can change between line by line or side by side comparison, whatever is easier to read. I can also just show the differences, whatever. So let's, let's take a look at the options I have. So bypass trust HTML replace with bypass trust style. Okay. That sounds brilliant. Or maybe trust resource URL. Mm hmm. Or maybe not do that shenanigans at all. Or let's do trust script. Oh yeah, that sounds great. That's, that is probably the, the good, the, the right answer. So let's submit this. And of course, it's not the right answer, but Drewshop will now explain to me why this is not correct. Right? So, of course, the, the right way is to not use this. There's no good reason to turn a security feature like this off. So let's select this answer and third time confetti. And now I get a short uh, information what why this is actually the correct answer. And now I can close this or I can jump to a Google form uh, where I can vote. We can either like or dislike with a comment um, this challenge and the same also works for the hacking challenge part. There's a total of 26 or 27 uh, coding challenges at the moment, so roughly uh, 26% of challenges have a coding challenge. Not all challenges can have a coding challenge because there are some which are very, where you have to follow a very complicated attack path with different steps and there's not one single line of code or set of lines uh, which is actually responsible. Also something quite fun with the coding challenges, sometimes there are there are lines in the code, which I, um, uh, let's, let's just open it up again. So if I, if I submit line six here, okay, this is, this is pretty obvious that this is only one line, but there are also some code snippets where multiple, uh, uh, lines are responsible for a problem. And sometimes you have something like a line with just a, uh, an, um, a curly bracket, right? Opening and closing around this. If these, these what we call neutral lines are selected along with the answer, it's still counted as correct, right? But if you would, would just uh, um, just select everything, for example, it would of course be be wrong because it uh, it actually doesn't allow you to select a non uninvolved line of code when you submit this. Okay, so jumping to a different feature. The juice shop is ready to do capture the flag events, 
That's why it doesn't uh, just have one logo. It has this second one with the with the flag as well. And um, this is basically a feature you can simply turn on in the configuration. Um, and then Jewshop with the success notifications will also emit a flag code that is dependent on a on a uh, on a key that you pass in during startup. What you can then do, you can use any score server that you like, where you somehow bring in the juice shop challenges. And as long as the score server is uh, filled with the, the same flag keys, basically, um, like your, your juice shop instance emits, um, you can basically copy them, paste them over at CTFD, for example, and then uh, get points in the, in the CTF, actually. And uh, the way that it's done, you you can, in theory, you can let every um, participant in the CTF use their own juice shop instance. What they need to share is uh, the this initialization code for the for the flags, basically. Um, I do not recommend to use juice shop for any commercial style CTFs because there's way too many solutions out in the internet in the form of uh, videos people did and there's also a complete book with all the step-by-step -step solutions uh, from me so you don't want to give out prizes just because someone uh, did did well in the CDF style but it's a fun exercise for teams for example or when it's not about uh, money or prizes but just for fun so you might ask how do I get 101 challenges with the corresponding flag codes into my CTFD server, for example. Lucky you're asking, because we already have a tool for that, which you can just run, and it will look like this. So on the command line, um, it will just ask you a couple of questions, and you can just select the ones you, are, you, you want, so you can pick the framework to generate the, the CTF for, like CTFD here in this case. You have to tell it where to retrieve the challenges from and where the CTF uh, key file is. You can also decide if hints should be allowed, if they should be free or paid or turned off. And then it will generate like a data dump in either a zip file for CTFD or an XML file for root the box, for example. And you can just import that into your CTF server and then you're basically good to go. Then you have out of the box the 101 challenges in CTFD, for example, and then the whole setup time for the CTF is like under five minutes. So here are just some screenshots. The root the box uh, folks actually uh, invested some more time and actually created some nice uh, icons for the tiles here, where they actually have for each category of juice shop challenges uh, different different uh, different tiles. So that's pretty pretty neat. Even better, if you want to, either for a CTF or for a, for a lecture or training, you want to uh, avoid that everyone has to run the juice shop on their own, you can use Multijuicer, which is a third-party project, um, which allows you to just spin up as many instances as you need. And it's quite, uh, quite sophisticated because it comes with its own juice balancer. So it it will in the end it's a Kubernetes cluster with uh, multiple juice shop instances which are fired up whenever you register a new team, and the juice balancer will make sure that you stick to your team's instance and that you cannot interact with the with the with the other ones. So pretty neat thing. And uh, in a in a recent release from of Multijuicer, um, they even added a little scoreboard. Which is quite rudimentary still, but it will tell you how many, uh, which uh, teams have the most points currently, and it uses the same calculation like we do uh, to to determine this, the the points for challenges if you do your CDF on your own, right? So it's like difficulty times x or and whatever, right? So this is pretty pretty straightforward to just simply get a get a classroom set up going and not having to worry about your students coming along with some old Node.js version or not having admin rights on their computer, etc. La la la, right? So the, the whole chore. Even another feature, you can run the juice shop with a completely different user interface. 
from a look and feel point of view. So the screenshots you see here are showing the um, the theme and the, the the customization that I'm using at uh, during awareness sessions at my company. So it's our company logo. The application name is different. There's different products in the store. Color is different and everything. This is really great because uh, it's much easier, especially when you do like management presentations or presentations to non-technical folks, if they have a be better context, right? So at when I'm doing developer trainings, I'm using the juice shop as it is with the juice and this stuff. And developers like it, right? So it's fun, it's nerdy, and uh, they get it, right? But if you uh, do a presentation to your CIO or even CEO, and I've done both, uh, it's actually better if it's a bit more, feels a bit more like uh, like it belongs to the company. And I was uh, even able to convince some groups which I presented to that this is actually the upcoming uh, merchandise store for for our company. Of course it's not, but uh, yes. So that's that's really neat for 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 immersion and for actually making it easier easier accessible. And this can be achieved purely by configuring the application. So you don't have to mess around with CSS files or other stuff. So there's a, a YAML configuration file where you can basically overwrite any property you want. And this is the default values. When if you just, for example, want to change the name into something else, like Ovasp Saftladen, if you want to use the German, the German word, uh, then you can just change that, and then you have a one-line YAML file. You run the conf that configuration, and it will use all the default values from the original config, and then just overwrite what you specified. And you can uh, this. There's lots of stuff behind these three dots, right? So there's all kinds of properties you can overwrite. <clears throat> you can even overwrite, as you've seen in the screenshots, the complete inventory. So you can define what products should be shown, how much they should cost. The image, which can be either a local image or you can put in a URL and then the during startup it will download the the file and put it into uh, into the application. It also has some properties here which seem a little bit maybe weird or not clear what they actually do. Um, so these are properties needed for the hacking challenges. And if you just, without knowing what you're doing, reconfigure the product list, you will probably break a lot of challenges. But Juice Shop makes sure that you can't start the application with a broken config. So it will tell you, for example, hey, I need at least one, or not at least, I need exactly one uh, product that is marked for this product tempering challenge. Because that will then be mentioned in the scoreboard of, of where you then have to go and then actually do some 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 exercise. It will, for example, also tell you uh, if you have, have uh, if you don't put any reviews into your products that it needs, I think, like three different reviews. Doesn't matter on what products, but in total there need to be three reviews for certain challenges to actually work. So that's, I would say that's not a five minute trivial task, but it's totally possible and has been done quite a few times and there's also example configs which are delivered with the juice shop. So there's a Mozilla theme, uh, there's an I think open security summit theme and, and uh, all, all kinds of things like four or five different themes which you can just take a look at to see how that how that works. Okay so much for the for the functionality part. Now a little bit more into the into the uh, behind the scenes part, so to say. So what is the architecture behind the, the juice shop? I mentioned it already. It's an Angular application in the front end. It has been uh, thoroughly migrated over time, over the course of nine years that it now uh, exists. So it started originally with Angular 1, had a complete rewrite into Angular 2. Um, so that was complete throw away right from scratch uh, front end redesign and uh, has been migrated ever since and now it's at uh, angular 15 or something right so it's it's pretty much up to date uh, in the back end we have uh, an express uh, server 
and that's running in Node.js, right? It's a Node.js framework. And yeah, also we make sure that all the newest Node.js versions always work. We kick out the ones which, uh, which are end of life, so we don't have to maintain crazy amounts of uh, legacy stuff. On the database side, it's very simple. So there's a SQLite file that is being generated at startup, and that is uh, that is basically all. There's also a NoSQL DB, but that's just running in memory. So that means the juice shop can, in its entirety, run just in a single Docker container. So you don't need to have some Docker Compose stuff with firing up Postgres here and that and this. Just one single simple container, npm start, and that's it. So that's why it's so easy to actually run anywhere. So if you have Node.js on your machine, you probably can get it running in no time. Downloading all the dependencies is probably the, the slowest part. And Jushop has a lot of dependencies. And it has a lot of broken dependencies. Um, you can run it locally in Docker. You can run it in Vagrant if you are into that. And all made for all major cloud uh, providers, we also have instructions. Jushop is also quite nicely translated into different languages. So all the, the size of the flag means the level of translation. So originally, it's everything is in English. I try to keep up with the German translation. Uh, Chinese and Spanish is also quite far up in the list of translations. And then we have lots of uh, ones where sometimes maybe just a couple of strings are translated. Um, I just a couple of days ago actually added uh, Gaelic as a, as a language. So if someone wants to Please feel free to contribute this to uh, to the project. So just to maybe quickly show you how that works. So if I go back to the product overview, uh, and I choose now, for example, I choose German. You can see that some things are immediately translated. But if I... And there was a little pop-up at the bottom, you maybe noticed, but it's already gone. So if I switch to Danish, uh, it now says, okay, you have to force a page reload to actually also get all the backend stuff translated. So the product names, the, if we go to the scoreboard, challenge descriptions, it's now all in German, right? And that's from the database and it, when the, um, the, the row is basically fetched and sent back to the, to the front end or sent back in the HTTP response, it's before intercepted and translated on the fly with some property files. The level of translation is, as I said, widely different between languages, um, and most focused on the front end part only. So I think German, Chinese, Spanish are the only ones where it's even or, uh, quite a lot translated, uh, even on the backend side. So the products and the challenges and everything is in that in that language. Then I'm a pretty big fan of test automation. So when I started the project, uh, I did that partly to have something for my trainings, and partly because I never did something with Node.js before and wanted to learn that for myself. And um, I played around with different test frameworks. And uh, so we have like unit tests, which are pretty straightforward with Karma and Jasmine as frameworks, for example. We have a layer with um, API tests, um, where basically the entire, I mean, the server is started and then the entire API is crawled and it, it, it's tested for certain, uh, for, for all kinds of features. And the most important part is our Cypress suite, which is end-to-end -end tests but not the way that you would normally write them. Because normally you write them to test the functionality of your application, right? Can I put something in the shopping basket? What happens when I click on checkout? Can I select my credit card? Yada, yada, yada. That's not what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in if you put this iframe uh, JavaScript pop-up string into the search field and click search, does this pop-up show up? Right, So the end-to-end -end test suite, it's basically automatically executing the 101 hacking challenges 
it's pretty impressive to watch when you have it locally, right? So because it will just hack like crazy. And um, I, for fun, also checked uh, how much of a cheat score you get when uh, it's when it's running, and I think it's at uh, like eighty nine or ninety percent uh, probability that you're cheating overall when you when you use the automated test suite. On the DevOps side, or on the operational side, if you will, we use lots of uh, code linting and uh, code quality tooling. Um, we use uh, GitHub Actions quite heavily and also some quite sophisticated ones, I would say. We publish our Docker images on Docker Hub. We have automated deployments to two different Heroku instances, one for the master branch, one for the development branch. And I always tell people they shouldn't hack either of those and nobody listens. So they just... So I have some monitoring on top of that and there's crazy stuff going on on the public instance. Um, we also do some uh, some automated baseline scans with Zap, but that's more for fun because I have a pretty long ignore list because I actually want certain challenges, uh, certain uh, vulnerabilities um, uh, happening, of course. You can also get some data out of Juice Shop quite nicely. So we have some webhook integrations. It's easy to actually set up a Grafana dashboard for monitoring and uh, so just one example, if you, during startup, pass in a webhook URL, then whenever a challenge is solved, you get this payload sent to that webhook, right? So it tells you what challenge it was, what the cheat score was, what the current total cheat score is, when the challenge was solved, and then the CTF flag, and also from where the challenge, uh, what machine it, the, the, this is coming from, basically. So this is... If someone actually wants to do a sophisticated training setup, they could actually build something around that, right? Also, out of the box, we deliver a JSON file with a predefined Grafana dashboard, which will show you everything that the juice shop can, uh, can, can give out. So it's from number of challenges solved, uh, cheat score, all that stuff, but also technical properties like uh, how many HTTP requests ran into problems because someone did something crazy, um, how often has it been restarted in the last uh, minutes, whatever. So, and there's also some business, what's well, it, business um, metrics like how many, how much money is in total in the in the uh, in-store wallets, for example. So, Crazy stuff like that, but it's it's a nice showcase for Grafana dashboards, especially if you've never done one you're on your own. So it's quite easy to to set up. Um, and as JuShop delivers all this data via Prometheus, Prometheus uh, endpoints, it's very easy to actually connect to a data source. I'm having uh, one Raspberry Pi running at home under my desk, twenty four seven. That is just producing this kind of dashboard for the public demo instance. That's why and how, how I know that there's crazy stuff going on there. Okay, this is my personal favorite slide, especially in this form because it's broken since this morning a little bit. Um, so this is our success pyramid. Normally it would show on the top here uh, a, a much shorter box saying that we have uh, had over time a total of 95 contributors in the project. And then it would have looked like a pyramid. But for some reason, GitHub doesn't, doesn't like me today. Um, but that's, that's how it is. But you can see this presentation is also dynamically pulling its data. So, uh, JuShop is a flagship project. Um, it even has a gold medal from the OpenSSF, uh, best practices. Uh, so even when it was still called core infrastructure initiative badge or something, um, I was told by the guys responsible uh, for that, that they had a few internal discussions before actually handing out that gold medal. Because uh, normally it's about you proving that your software is very, very secure. So, and I was basically proving the software is very, very secure, except for the few parts that are supposed to be not secure, right? But the whole build process and all that stuff is uh, in pretty good shape, I would say. 
Same for test coverage and general code maintainability. So it's, if you are into, I mean, if you're good with JavaScript or you're willing to learn, uh, then it's actually pretty easy to get into this. Although it's already nine years old, right? So it's, uh, it's a quite well maintained code base. We have a few weak spots, of course, but who doesn't? Um, and on the download or consumption side, um, well, okay, 7,700 stars at GitHub is not, not bad. It's almost, uh, it's approaching 200,000 downloads of the GitHub releases. So the pre-packaged GitHub releases. Some people even still download it on SourceForge. So why, that's why I still publish it there. Although I'm personally not using it. And the Docker image has in total been pulled, uh, 57 million times. That includes a certain period where I think it was the fault of this multi-juicer project. They had some bug for some time where they accidentally pulled a lot of images unnecessarily. So they bumped up that number, I think, back in the day to like 10 million pretty quickly, so surprisingly quickly. But the the, the, the other 40 million that came on top, uh, that wasn't them. So it seems to be used quite a bit. Okay, last part. If you want to contribute to the project, there's different ways to actually do so. Of course, you can contribute to the code itself. And we have a backlog of, of uh, GitHub issues. And as it's as we are approaching the Google Summer of Code season again, uh, I like to actually collect a few issues and keep them open. And they are tagged with, uh, for example, good first issue or help wanted or both to show, hey, this is a beginner friendly um, um, issue or this is the help wanted means this is something that I personally am I'm not good with. So I would actually uh, need some help with this. You can, of course, also uh, help with the translations. So similar to, to Zap, um, Juice Shop is using CrowdIn, which is pretty straightforward uh, to actually do trans translations online. And it will then uh, generate pull requests automatically uh, into, the, into the project. So there's no need to manually edit the JSON files in, in the application, uh, in the GitHub repository. You can just uh, log into CrowdIn and do it there if you like. And for any language you want. If you need some assistance to get started, um, there's actually two dedicated chapters in the official companion guide about this. One is, uh, the codebase 101, which gives you a run through, uh, of the, of the actual, how the code is lay, the code looks like, how is it structured and that kind of stuff. And then there's, uh, the contribute to development guide, which is our very extensive contribution guidelines, so to say. And of course, you can always ask questions either in our community chat or in Slack. We have a dedicated channel, of course. If you do, contribution and you are not already have tons of stickers from a conference like this um, you I will typically after merging the first uh, your first pull request I will uh, ask you to send me your address and I will I can say I will immediately send you stickers but I will put your uh, your data into a totally privacy secure Google task list and uh, then when I have a batch collected then I will go to the post office and send out a few, a few stickers. And our Google Summer of Code students, uh, they sometimes get a little bit more. So last for the student last year, uh, he actually got a hoodie and some other nice swag sent over from, from Germany to India. And I think the postage was more expensive than the hoodie. But that it's worth it. And he's now part of the uh, Juice Shop core team, core team, actually. So. Last slide, actually, or almost, um, the project roadmap. So as I said, we have quite a few uh, ideas for the, for the Google Summer of Code this year. One is that we carried over from last year, because it didn't happen, is a renovation of the scoreboard. You can, might notice that I'm not a UX expert, so that's how this, why the scoreboard looks like it does. Um, it, I have some ideas how it could be nicer but I'm not really able to design it properly. So that's why I would hope for a Google Summer of Code project to do that. Also the ebook, 
that um, that you can also read online is currently uh, generated using Gitbook. Uh, that's quite legacy. So moving away from that into something I don't know more recent like ASCII Dog or whatever, that might be a nice idea. And also we had the idea to include some Web three specific uh, hacking challenges into Juice Shop. That is a bit of a complicated one because then you either have to uh, integrate with some crazy actual blockchain stuff or you have to run your own in-memory blockchain or at least a fake blockchain or something like that. So that's that might be a nice, a nice fun exercise for a student to actually figure that out. And also I mentioned our cheat detection is not that sophisticated yet, but uh, that might also be a smaller sum of code project to to enhance how the juice shop determines if you are not playing by the rules, so to say. And then some smaller stuff like um, adding some some more metrics to our to our monitoring. Um, I am pretty unhappy that our test coverage is sitting at eighty eight percent. I liked it more when it was ninety, but not that bad. And of course, <clears throat> one of the biggest uh, biggest uh, goals for the roadmap and kind of. Uh, connected to this idea to do something Web3 is uh, to sell our NFT collection. And if you're thinking, well, they, they don't seriously have an NFT collection, yes, we do. So um, there's actually on OpenSea a collection where you can buy Juicy Bot or Juicy Chatbot and uh, also the Evil Wasp, which is in form of magnets up there, or the little Mask Juicy Bot. And they are more rare, so they are a little bit more pricey, but it's still very... Let's say the price prices are very decent. So it's like I think twenty euros for these and forty for these or something. So nothing which I can then use to move over to Hawaii or something like that. But yeah, it played quite nicely into the whole fun thing. And we like fun things, right? So um my audio here is broken, so I cannot play this, but uh, we actually even have a jingle for the project. And it's uh, it's also part of one of the hacking challenges. This bonus payload um, XSS is actually uh, you will actually get a player inside the juice shop injecting a, cloud, a sound cloud uh, a player to actually play our jingle, and it has been played I think seventy five thousand times or something like that. So quite quite nice, and it's actually a really good song. So it's not me singing that wouldn't be good, but there was actually a really uh, a uh, very nice singer songwriter who actually did this for us. So, if you're interested in more stuff about the juice shop, just go to the website. Um, it has basically everything I told you in one form or another. Um, it will also link you to all the side projects. Um, the main project is at is of course juice shop MIT licensed. The CTF extension is also MIT licensed, so very friendly licensing model. Um, the ebook is. Creative Commons for non-commercial use. You can use it as you want. So, but not rewrite and republish, please. And all the juice shop artwork, I probably shouldn't tell you because I want to sell those NFTs, but uh, they are actually also available in, uh, in the official OWASP swag um, directory. So that's basically all I have, unless you have some questions or want to really quickly go to lunch. Thank you for listening and hope you will play a little bit with this application. So, and on the way out, don't forget to take some, some pins and magnets. They're actually really only in this room. For free? Yes. So, yeah, 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 of course. Those are, those are for free. Uh, yeah. yeah. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, where did the idea of the shop come from? Okay. Just, uh, come out of nowhere, or no, uh, a budget store basically. So if you know that one, uh, that's basically Simon Bennett's uh, little pet application for uh, testing uh, Zap stuff, and it has been for many years. But it's a Java server page application, so it's not. It doesn't really help if you teach your developers with that in, anymore. Um, so I basically started off with, okay, I want to do something like the budget store, but with a modern tech stack. 
and then it kind of uh, grew with more exercises and the scoreboard being bigger, prettier, and then when it was, I think in, in the initial version it had like thirty something challenges, and then I filed it for OWASP, for becoming an OWASP project, so it was already done and it became an OWASP project, and then it kind of took off and grew into this uh, huge thing. But the idea was really just for trainings in-house uh, to actually give developers something that they really use in their daily work and not some PHP, JSP, ASP, whatever the other applications typically are. Yes? Yeah, first, how did you know that? Very good. Okay, so actually, let me just let me just check here. Actually, we have uh, uh, let me check. We have actually a thread dragon thread model okay. already, which is pre a prepared data flow diagram for the for the actual juice shop. I mean, if I click on this, it doesn't really help, but it, it, that's there. You can import that into the into OWASP thread, dra thread Dragon and then start from there. Then you don't have to. I mean, may, 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 maybe your diagram that you use is even better. So uh, I'm happy to to use that one. But this is we already have something. But otherwise, not no. Okay. Yeah, it's the thread model JSON. So that, that is the, a quite simple DFD. I think it doesn't have any threads in it. I think it's really just the, the diagram to get started if you want to do a fake thread modeling session with Juice Shop. Actually, when some, uh, some years ago at one of the, um, open security summits in, in London, um, I participated in a little thread modeling session with uh, Adam Shostek, who basically, we basically did a fake, Analysis of the of the juice shop and drew like uh, uh, diagrams on whiteboards and paper and so on. That, that was quite fun actually. Okay, no further questions. We contact you through OWASP or um, any other contact if you want to join or contribute. Whatever you like, OWASP email, Slack, uh, Gitter. Uh, Twitter direct message. It's it's okay, completely up to you. Always, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm around everywhere basically. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, Grab some stuff.